Hi folks, welcome back to On Call yeah. with Insignia, where you go on call with leaders uh, changing the future of emerging markets across the globe. And for this episode, we have a very special guest who's actually dialing in from an ocean away. Um, and we're very happy to have him you know, on the show, making time for us. Very busy man. But uh, for this uh, particular call, we'll actually have you know, my co-host uh, and you know, founding ma managing partner of Insignia Ventures, England, actually introduce our very special guest. So England, take it away. Yes, thank you, Paulo. And I, as Paulo mentioned, today I'm very privileged and we're very pleased to have someone I've admired for a long time, one of our Insignia's role models, the co-founder and managing partner of Kasek Ventures, which I think is, if there's only one fund in Let Them that you need to know, it's them, you know, and founding managing partner, Hernan Kasek, who has been learning a lot and we see a lot of similarities between South Asia and Let Them. And without further ado, I'd like to ask Hernan to quickly introduce himself and walk our listeners through his personal journey because I think Kasek started quite a while back, but they have quickly developed into one of the force of nature's in the startup ecosystem in Latam. He was one of the co-founders of Mercado Libre. I wanted him to talk through his personal journey from you know, PNG to Mercado Libre to Kasek and how you have seen the Latam startup ecosystem evolve over that period of time. Great, no, thank you so much for inviting me. And, and thank you for all the listeners of this episode. Pleasure to be here. So as you well said, I started my professional career working in Procter & Gamble as a brand manager. Clearly something very different versus what I do with BDAs. But I think it was a, a great school in general terms about what it means to, to run a, a business. And I got two very important things from, from there. One, I, I realized that I really like it to lead businesses. At that time, being a brand manager meant that you had a small business that you had to decide on and, and, and see what marketing strategy you wanted to pursue, what were the right price strategies, etc. So it gave me a really good idea about what the business world was, and I really liked that. And then interestingly, in those early days of my career, I was a young professional, obviously not paying too much attention at doing things by the book, etc. I wanted to be a rebel. And I always complained about the bureaucracy that I thought that PNG had. Then a few years later, we started a Mercado Libre. Then we had a company of our own. And I realized how important it was to have those processes so things could be under control. So when we launched Mercado Libre, we applied a light version of those bureaucratic process that I, I saw in, in Procter & Gamble around performance matrices and budgeting processes and performance reviews, those kind of things that really were very important for setting the, the base of what company wanted to, to build. So I spent a few years in, in Procter & Gamble in Latin America, working in different countries. Then I decided to go to business school and I was very fortunate to go to Stanford for my MBA at the time of the bubble. So I, I went to Stanford in 1997. It was the time when Netscape was ruling and the internet was suddenly available to almost everyone. So, so all business models started to, to pop up. And I think the first wave around consumer internet really took off. Uh, and being at the Silicon Valley during that period of time, I think it had a significant influence in, in me and what I ended up doing later. So during the years at, at Stanford, I met Marcos Galperin, who's still the CEO of, of Mercado Libre. And he has this idea of, of at the time it was to take the, the eBay idea into Latin America. Then Mercado Libre grew into something much more complex and comprehensive than just an eBay, and today you can say that it's the, the Amazon plus, plus the PayPal plus the, the, the one of the number one credit providers of, of Latin America. But at the time, that was the idea, so, so I, I was working on some other projects and had the, the bright moment of deciding to leave those projects and join Marcos. We graduated in 1999, went back to uh, Latin America and started uh, working on, on Mercado Libre. Long story short, I stayed there for 12 years, first as COO and then as CFO. 
we went through the typical, it was not that typical in Latin America, journey of a startup that literally got started in a garage, went through several rounds of financing, went to even more crises and challenges and things that fortunately we, we could pass, but, but they were very, very difficult. We IPO'd in 2007, and since then the company kept on, on growing. Today it's a $60 billion market cap company, the number one technology uh, enterprise in the region. And in 2011, I decided to leave uh, Mercado Libre, and I got together with another colleague from, from the company, Nicolas Secasi, who was the initial CFO of the company and stayed there for, for nine, 10 years. And together we launched Kasek Ventures with the idea of building a true venture capital firm for, for Latin America. In our days as entrepreneurs, we had investors, but those investors were, were mainly banks or, or other kind of private equity investor that did not really understand technology, that did not really understand the, the startup world. So some of them were, were, were really good people and, and tried to help us. Some of those were, were not so helpful. But, uh, but they were not uh, former uh, VCs. They were not entrepreneurs that could really understand what it meant to build a company from the ground up. So with that idea of starting creating what we had seen in the Silicon Valley in Latin America, we founded Kasek. And, and again, fast forwarding, following 11 years, we have seven funds, five early stage funds two opportunity funds. We're currently fundraising for another early stage fund and another opportunity fund. We've invested in over hundred companies. We think that some of the most successful companies in Latin America are in our portfolio and that those companies are the ones that will be the leaders of the next uh, decades. That is a, an overview of my tw last 25 years. No, that's, I think a great, great journey that you have shared with us. And, and I wanted to we go back and talk about the Mercado Libre on two axes. One is that actually you had a role change, right? You were initially the CEO, then you were CFO. And I thought that was very interesting in the transition of roles. And the second thing, which is actually quite quite relevant for our founders today, is that you you grew like Mercado Libre through the dot-com crash, IPO, and the, the 08 recession. And I think going forward, the next 12, 18, 24, 36 months is going to be a daunting period for founders. So. I wanted to sort of distill these two things which you could share with our listener base today on how the first the role change, the expansion of role, and then two, building Mercado Libre through a crisis. What are the lessons you've learned? As I said, I was first the COO of the company and, and I was responsible for, for the operations, for all the country operations, all of, of marketing, product, customer service, fraud control, etc. I really liked that piece and, and it had a lot to do with what I had seen in my PNG days as, as a manager of, of a company. So I really liked that. But then in 2008, nine, who's today my, my co-founder at Kasek, Nicolas Sekasi, and at that time was the CFO of Mercado Libre, decided to leave the, the company. And we wanted to have someone as a CFO that could really tell the story to to the market, to, to the analysts. We were a young public company at the time, so we thought that someone that was a co-founder, someone that had a deep understanding of the business and obviously some, some, some reasonable financial experience could do that well. So, so I took over the role of, of CFO and I think it was a great experience for me to complement the, the, the heavy duty operational experience that I had had with being the CFO of, of a public company. And obviously I had a, a great team of financial professionals that would back me up in, in any, any particular technical aspect that I might might not have. So I think it worked uh, really well. And, and, and by the way, the person that at that time was, was really uh, helping me and also had a more kind of operational past, Pedro Arndt, is today the CFO of, of Mercolio. So we, we somehow continued that tradition of having CFOs that really understand the business and, and maybe get more the strategic side of it rather than the, the pure financial accounting side of, of the operation. And the other question that you said, we went through lots of storms 
Uh, you mentioned some that are well known because those were global crises, so, so the dot com bubble and the, the 2008 financial crisis, and, and what well, the COVID, uh, more, more recently as an investor and all that. But if you live in Latin America, you not only get hit by all the global crisis, but you have one in every country every year. So, so we went through significant crisis in Venezuela, in Argentina, in, in Brazil. So, so somehow we, we got used to it. Uh, but yeah, certainly those were very tough times. I think that the toughest one was the dot-com bubble, because at that time we had a gigantic dream, but a tiny, tiny business that was burning money and basically having little or no revenues. So it was hard to accommodate things to go through, through that tough period. But we focused on, on what we believed in. We worked hard, always maintained high spirits and a, very importantly, a long-term commitment to what we're doing. And things worked out really well. Fantastic. And shifting gears to Tasek, and you mentioned briefly earlier, you embraced a new style of venture capital versus one that you experienced. Maybe can you talk a little bit more about some of the changes you made or some of the principles that you had and how you implemented it as you started CASEC? Sure. So we, we think of CASEC more as entrepreneurs and, and former operators partnering with founders rather than investors deploying capital. Obviously, yeah, the firm grew and as we, we have more capital under management, we need to also put on our heads the CIO role and I think of allocation of capital, etc. But what we really, really like and what we're passionate about is to connect with the entrepreneurs, to try to, to get their dreams into our veins and help them build those, those companies, help them accomplish those, those visions. So we tend to be quite hands-on investors, particularly at the beginning. So we not only provide capital to the companies and, and also obviously participate at the board and have strategic discussions with the founders, but we also try to help them around growth strategies, around product usability, conversion rate. We have in our firm two big teams, one that works around growth and is focused on technology, on how to build your infrastructure, how to get users organically, etc. And then another team that works on recruiting because we found that the two most important uh, pain points or challenges that typical entrepreneurs have are on the one hand, how to grow efficiently and the other uh, was how to add talents to the team because typically you have one, two or three co-founders and you need to add a whole team around them. That's fantastic. I think one of the founding principles of uh, Kasek is to partner with founders, you know, as you mentioned, very hands-on in the seed stage. Could you share one story that you consider to be Kasek's most prominent or meaningful exit that the firm has partnered from early days and, and the role that you have played? Yeah, sure. It's a story that I think somehow, you know, it's a company called Nubank that today is the largest digital bank in the world started in Brazil, now expanded also into Mexico and Colombia. The company went public in December 2021. It raised its market cap is 22, $23 billion. Before the, the, the current reset of prices in the market, it was worth $40 billion. And we believe it's a company that will be worth eventually $100 billion that will produce significant cash flows and that will continue expanding its businesses in each of the countries where it is operating today and also to some other countries. We think it's a terrific company. Uh, by the way, I was mentioning that Mercado Libre was, is the largest technology company in Latin America. Nubank is the second largest. So, so in one, we were involved as, as entrepreneurs, founders, operators, and in the other, we were very involved as, as angel investors. And in the case of, of, of Nubank, we, we knew David Vélez, the founder from our prior experience in Mercado Libre because he used to work at General Atlantic that was one of the investors of, of Mercado Libre. So we had connected with him during those days. Then he went to Stanford and, and both my partner and I went to Stanford Business School. So, so we had some connections with him through that. 
And he ended up going to Chicago, started investing in Latin America. We did things with them. So when he decided to leave Sequoia and start a bank in, in Brazil, on the one hand, we thought he was totally crazy because that market was a big oligopoly of a few banks dominating everything. But we thought that the GMB, the opportunity was a very big one, but it made sense to try to disrupt it with, with technology, with, with better services, with, with lower costs. And we thought that David, given what we thought at the time of him, then he ended up proving much, much, much more than what we thought in our best case scenario. We thought that he had a chance at that. So, so we invested there and we, we became a larger holder because we invested in their seed round before he, he even got his co-founders. And then we kept on investing in the company along the way with our early stage funds and then also with our opportunity funds. And we're still a big, big fan. So what well, David and the team are building there. That's a great story. And one that resonates with lots of the teams and the belief in founders that we have as well. And I want to shift gears. So obviously New Bank, you see that in early days, as your funds get bigger, how does your approach to supporting founders differ from the sort of early stage to, you know, expansion capital to the growth stage? That's a great question. So as I said, early stage, we try to, to be very hands-on. Obviously 99% of the work is done by the founder, but we try to add the 1% that hopefully adds value into that equation. For the Opportunity Fund, we do mainly one thing that is to continue investing uh, in the later stage round of our early stage portfolio. So somehow there's some, a continuity with most of, of our capital because we end up investing in companies that we are already working with. So that, that is just another step into the same direction of helping those entrepreneurs build uh, their dreams. Uh, those uh, companies we invest in as, as they start maturing and developing a more senior team, they start requesting less of our help around particular points like product or marketing. But we will continue to be quite involved in more strategic matters whenever there's a round or a company is considering going public, etc. We do participate there and we try to remain active. But certainly the kind of involvement once the company grows and brings very capable professionals, we, we tend to act more as traditional board members and financial investors and not so much as someone that is close to the action and close to the operation with the fund. That's fantastic. And I wanted to also find a dot between Southeast Asia and LATAM, which is based on what you have seen in LATAM and what you observe maybe from far from Southeast Asia, what is something some of our Southeast Asia founders can, can learn from Latin America. And obviously you are one of the godfathers of the Latin America startup landscape and vice versa. I have to be modest with that because I really know very little about the Southeast Asia first hand. Obviously I read everything and, and try to follow the market. And there are several very interesting companies that have emerged in the region. And, and we try to see if we can find something similar in, in Latin America, or if we can learn from some of those companies, a thing here or there to then apply that to our portfolio company. But I'm not an expert in the space, but, but what I can say is what, what has happened in Latin America was that initially we were more influenced by the consumer model that was coming from the US, more a one click pony, but that would do that really, really, really well with lots of depth and more based on, on, on an origin, you know, from, from, from websites, from, from, from desktops, no, not, not from mobile, more around app, mobile and, and this concept of the super app, right? So, so you have many solutions within one company, within one app. So Latin America started being hundred percent, the U S model, then it started to shift and to it's a hybrid between those two models. I think that from, from what I see in, in Asia, it's still that horizontal model. I'm sure there are some opportunities where that combination might uh, make sense. We, I don't think that, that vertical is best for everything, but probably horizontal is not best for everything either. So there might be some, some kind of combination that can create very innovative business models that entrepreneurs might uh, try to look into and, and from there 
try to create the, the new wave of, of startups that get that right. Well, that's great. And I think on that note, we also seen quite a few Southeast Asian companies expand their operations in Latin, you know, including one of our companies, Wiz.ai and I think C Limited as well as I think a presence in, in, in Brazil. And I think what this is interesting because I think one of the trends we're seeing in Southeast Asia is that, hey, we are seeing companies headquartered in Singapore, maybe of engineering, you know, in Vietnam or China, but targeting the world, including Latin. I wonder whether you see the same trend in Latin where you are seeing Latin companies going global and also how do you feel about the direction of other companies coming to Latin and obviously how have Latin companies reacted to that? That's a very accurate observation. Early days of, of technology of the internet in Latin America, it was all about US companies getting into the region, Maybe a European company, more of the telcos trying to do that play. And obviously some, some local players trying to, to expand there. Slowly but steadily, as the tech ecosystem started to, to grow in, in Asia, we began to see many more Asian companies in, in Latin America. And I think that's, a, that's great. That, that's a demonstration of how big or how relevant the market has become. So, so when Global companies look for opportunities where they can expand their business. They consider Latin America. I think the kind of gaps or, or, or underserved markets that we have in Latin America are similar to those that you may encounter in Southeast Asia. So if someone is solving you know, something for an you know, education sector or, or for distribution sector or, or something around you know, healthcare in, in Asia, probably the same problem is in Latin America. So, so then, then how you apply that solution to that market, you might need to adjust things here or there. But, but I think the root of the problem is probably the same one. Then you need to see if you can apply the same solution or an adapted solution to, to that market. But we think this is great, particularly for, for, for consumers and for hopefully what we believe in CASEC is that through technology, we're going to help developing countries narrow some of the gaps they have around financial inclusion, around access to education, access to, to good health care, etc. So, so the more services we have trying to tackle those problems, the better. Then obviously we want our company to be the one that are solving that. But I think the most important thing is for the ecosystem to grow, for, for, for the customers and, and, and population in general to do well. And that can come from, from different angles, from local companies, from global companies, from companies coming from Asia, etc. And what we've had is a few companies that have gone from Latin America to, to other parts of, of the world. We haven't seen that many, but there are a few that have done really well. And I'm sure that as the ecosystem continues to mature locally, we're going to see more of those in the next few years. Oh, that's great. I think one of the interesting things is cassette in numbers, right? 114 ventures, 275 entrepreneurs, over seven funds across 12 years. Obviously, Casa has a big impact on the Latin ecosystem. What's the thinking on the next five years? Next five years? We're very excited about what will come in the next five years. All secular technology trends continue to be very strong. As we all know, the tech system has gone through some rough times lately, but that is more because of valuations, because of access to capital and what has happened with now having interest rates that are positive and expensive versus all, almost negative in the past. But if you look at our companies, they are all growing 100 plus percent year on year. Consumers are demanding more digital services. Companies are also demanding more digitalization. So we only see things growing. I think that we have an amazing number of, of examples of how technology is really uh, taking over everything and, and by the way, improving everything. You know, that it takes control and, and that's about thing. I think it's a terrific thing and it's improving the experience of, of everything. It's improving efficiencies in, efficiency in businesses. It's a terrific trend, the one we're seeing. And that will continue to happen in, in the region. Today, we, you have a, a couple of, of, of large companies in Latin America that are tech related, like Mercoli or Nubank. I'm sure that in five years, you want to have a, a few more. And in 10 years, you want to have all of the top companies are going to be technology companies. 
But that's great. And hopefully many of them will become tech portfolio. <laughs> And we have a masterclass section and you have worked with many founders. You are CFO of Mercado Libre. If you were to give a masterclass on developing or maturing startups, finance function and capability, what would be one key takeaway you would want your class of CFOs or founders to come to bring home from the session? That's a, a great and, and tough question because they have a nominee list of things. But if I get to pick one, I think you can oversimplify it around allocation of resources. That is what you do in any business at the end of the day. It's very important that you have the finance function with, with that idea very clear in their minds, understanding what they should do, what risk they should take, what they should not take, what thing they, they should avoid. It's really about resource allocation. And that is, by the way, what an entrepreneur does, right? It's like how, how to allocate resources efficiently to try to produce the kind of revolution that they want to produce. And if I had to add a second one, I just kind of a fine print, I would say slowly but steadily start also building the procedures and controls because what you want is for your company to, to scale in a healthy manner with, with good controls and, and not things going out of whack. That's great. I think that's a great summary. Moving on to the rapid fire corner, which is, we ask a question, you, you come up with a short, crisp reply. First question is, what digital technology innovation excites you the most today? Chat GPT. Very good. If you were to produce your own Netflix series, what would be the title? Accomplishment of the Unlikely. Oh, that's a great, a great topic. <laughs> Looking back now, what is one skill, either soft or hard skill, that you wish you have learned back as a student? Coding, programming. I oh, think okay. I should have been better at that. That's a good one. If there's one thing you could automate in your job, what would be? Back office. Back office. That's great. Yep. And what is your favorite destination in Latin? And also what destination would you want to visit in Southeast Asia? In Latin America, the, the Patagonia, in particular the Andes region, it's a beautiful area. You should all visit it. And in Southeast Asia, when I was graduating from Stanford, I had a, a trip planned to, to Southwest e Asia, in particular to, to Thailand, and that plan never materialized. It was a good reason. We, we, we started working right after graduation and I never stopped. Okay. Uh, and, and I've been to, to Asia a few times, to China, a few times to, to Japan, uh, went nearby to, to Australia, but never, never to Thailand. So I think that's the destination I want to visit. We'd love to host you next time you're in, in, in Southwest Asia or Thailand. Thank you. Favorite activity to de-stress? Favorite activity to de-stress? Physical activity. I used to be a, a runner, half and full marathons. Nowadays, I, I really got uh, hard into CrossFit and I really like it because once you, you get physically tired, your mind goes blank and you just focus on the task you, you are you know, <laughs> doing. And, and, and then I think it's very relaxing, at least for me. Oh, that's great. And anything you have read at our favorite book? Favorite book, Snow One, the, the biography of uh, Warren Buffett, and a recent one, Power No. Uh, oh, okay. But I think everyone that is in this business should read. Oh, that's a great book. And on that note, I, I would like to really thank, you know, Hernan for spending his precious time and sharing his insights about LATAM, about Static, Mercado Libre, Castec, and the journey so far. And uh, it's really been enjoyable and we love to learn and I'm sure our founders in all parts of the world will benefit from this session. Thank you so much, Hernan. Thank you, everyone. 